begin uh, with a story. When, uh, when I was in uh, Phoenix and working with the uh, IF organization there called the Valley uh, Interfaith Project, working uh, with, with John, for example, John Hearn, uh, we began to work with a United Methodist Church, and this is the Paradise Valley Church, John, you know that one. Uh, some folks say that has more millionaires than any single church, at least in the United Methodist Church in the United States. I've heard that. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's what was said. We began to work with those folks, and quite frankly, uh, I was worried about it. I said, I, I don't think these people are, people are going to be interested in uh, the kind of organizing we're doing. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to be wasting our money. And Joe Rubio said, well, let's just see, let's, let's get out there. Let's find out what they're, let's talk to them. Let's do a lot of one-on-ones and uh, one-on-one. -on -one, that's when you sit down with one person. We'll talk about that more next week. Sit down with one person and try to find out what their passions are, you know, what they're really interested in and care about, what their interests are in one sense. So we began to uh, have conversations with these people in Paradise Valley and uh, got them involved in the organizing process. And so they met some other people in other churches and other you know, settings that were part of VIP. And uh, I'll be darned if uh, a group of the people in that church didn't become a very effective part of the IAF there in town and worked with us. In fact, they often would have meetings at their church. Uh, you, in, in organizing, you'll sometimes have a, um, um, uh, a, a university academy of sorts that is where you teach about a social issue and um, so we would have somebody come in I think we had the secretary of state come in one time and talk about state taxes with us for example and they were they were effective in getting him there uh, in fact I think the fact that we were inviting him to come to that place was a uh, was part of his motivation for coming so anyhow <clears throat> um, what I'm trying to say is when we started talking to the people at Paradise Valley about what their interests were, I was kind of amazed that when they then began to work with other organizing efforts and to work on the common good, their interests kind of began to overlap and, 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 the, and the interests of others and their interests began to coincide. And we were able to do any number of actions and things with them that quite frankly, I would never have believed we could have done. You know, now I don't, I don't mean to say they became the radical left or anything like that. I'm just saying some of the issues there in Arizona, they began to work with us on and it, and it was an effective, uh, it was an effective part of the organizing work. So that millionaire church, if you will, illustrates what I want to talk about in terms of interest. And in a real sense, what I want to talk about a little later in terms of power. But that brings us to our major two concerns tonight, those of uh, interest and power. Now, interest or self-interest. Um, the way that's usually understood is various. Um, it can be understood as selfishness. Hey, this is my interest. I don't care what happens to you. This is what I'm going to pursue. Or it can be kind of a rational calculation of advantage. What is my advantage in this given setting and how do I pursue what's good for me? Or it can be determined by a cost-benefit analysis. Let me see how much this, this work is going to cost me. Uh, how, much am I, how much am I going to reap from it if I get invested in it? So that kind of cost-benefit analysis, one can talk about interest in that kind of more rational way, I suppose you could say. And then, of course, there are things like long-term interest and enlightened self-interest but interest operates in our language in in those venues and more back uh, oh not 10 years ago i did a study of reinhold niebuhr's social thought and uh turned out a book on it and i was uh kind of shocked because niebuhr always talked about self-interest and uh, said a lot of pretty good stuff about it but when i began to study him i found out he used the word 10 10 different ways and so there wasn't a consistent use of interest in Niebuhr's work, which uh, kind of struck me strangely at the time, although part of the work of that book, that's what I mean by the complications of the use of the word interest. It's used in all kinds of ways. A man named Albert Hirschman 
did a study of over 500 years of the use of uh, the word entries. And what he found was how much the word varies in its use over that time. Uh, there is no single use of the word interest, and it cannot be essentially defined, I would say, at least in terms of the way it gets used, because it gets used in so many ways and used so widely. In fact, uh, Thomas B. Macaulay was critiquing another pos person's position, uh, in which that person seemed to him to be saying by interest what people prefer. <laughs> And his comment was about it that you see there, if interest means that people had rather do what they had rather do, what we have is a totality. In other words, you haven't said anything. You said you just said people want to do what they want to do. Uh, I'm, I'm interested, too, in Daniel Kahneman. I don't know if you know his name, um, but he's a, he's a uh, 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 Nobel Prize winning psychologist. And he's been studying uh, how people think and the motivations of people for some time. He's got a book, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. I would think that would be the number one text if you wanted to read him further. Um, but he talks about the question of the rationality of interest. That is, how rational are they at the point of a person uh, you know, pursuing uh, cost-benefit, are pursuing their advantage, are pursuing what they uh, actually want. And he did this study of business people, which I thought was kind of interesting. And he says, when you talk to these folks, you're going to have real questions about how rational interests really are. For example, he talks about the role of an optimism bias in a capitalist economic order. He was shocked by the disproportionate role that optimists play. And he argued also for a hubris hypothesis. That is that executives who run huge risks in taking over other companies and acquisitions and mergers, he says, you have to look pretty hard to find anywhere where that's really rational. Look at what he says. These efforts to integrate large firms, now this is a result of his research. Now he's not just expressing an opinion, he's reporting his findings, all right? These efforts to integrate large firms fall, fail more often than they succeed. And he says it's a result explained by the finding that the executives of the acquiring firm are simply less competent than they think they are. Uh, further, he says business leaders are often too overconfident. And uh, I'm, I'm just reporting what he says here. Financial leaders of large corporations had no clue about the short-term future of the stock market. And he says the correlation between their estimates and the true value that's there is slightly less than zero. Hmm. So he says business leaders are often too overconfident, but optimism is highly regarded both socially and in the market. And he reports, people and firms reward the providers of dangerously misleading information more than they reward truth tellers. You hear what he's saying? He's saying that it's these optimistic people who often drive business enterprises and that uh, they're, they're, not, they're not the most in touch with reality at that point. They're not the truth leaders. They actually give misleading information, but they get followed. He says a lot of times a company is successful <laughs> because, uh, because they pursued the more optimistic route and not because that was the most rational thing to do. You hear, you hear what he's, uh, am I communicating that? He also notes that uh, business leaders often ignore what the competition is doing when they make marketing decisions. So he arrives at this kind of notion. Interest is a highly variable concept. Its meaning is determined by its use. That's Wittgenstein in there. It has no essence that can be applied like a template on the motivations or the actions of people. On the other hand, remember this, the notion that interest can simply be understood as a rational process attending to advantage or some cost or benefit analysis of a situation is quite simply a gross simplification and distortion of human motivation 
and decision making. What kind of, let's stop for a moment because I've, I've kind of thrown a lot at you there in a hurry, but what kind of comments are, do you have? Questions if you have those. Is this a fair example of what you've just said, cuz, about overconfidence and misleading? I don't know if you're following Elon Musk and his Twitter stuff right now. Huh. And he's gotten himself in real trouble with oh, I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other. I already got money lined up, yada, yada, yada. And uh, he's getting a lot of blowback. Huh. And I'm reminded of, a. Uh, if you don't know Musk, you can't really appreciate this because he he is mouthy and, and successful and not huh. successful. Well, he's one but, of the richest people in the world. He, yeah. Yeah. And you remember an expression out of our childhood. He claims to be able to buy Twitter and clean it up uh -huh. and begin to look like he's in trouble. And the expression of our childhood fits this competence issue you're talking about. It may be his alligator mouth has overloaded his mockingbird rear end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you can certainly read Kahneman that way that uh, that the at least the business people he studied uh, can can are, are often flat do that yeah and yet at the same time it's sometimes the optimists who are arguing something that's clearly not verified by the self-interest or the rationality of the situation and yet they're still successful so now that's not the majority report he he would contend but that happens yeah. that is sometimes a mockingbird uh, backside can be very valuable if you need to fly rather than, you know, slide through the water. So uh, yeah, that's, that's torturing that metaphor, but nevertheless, wow. Other comments? Does this make sense to you? I mean, is this, is this clear what Kahneman's suggestion about interest? All I'm trying to do right now is to say that when you use the word interest, it can be used in many, many ways. There's no essence to it. There's no singular meaning. Uh, it really depends on, you know, how a person uses it. And historically, it's been used in a, in a wide range of ways. And you got to look at it as it applies in this context, is I yeah. think what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. yeah. Oh, historic, historical context, yeah. And I think you're also hinting, I think, at uh, understanding it in... Uh, in situational context that you might be in, in business or in other things, you know. Um, I, I think it's important for clergy to remember this because I'm not so sure pastors do much better on this than the business folk he reports on. <laughs> uh, I think I think his point does have some expansive quality to it. Mean by that, that uh, I think what he finds out about business people, I don't want us just, you know. Uh, squatting on business people, I, I think I think there are all kinds of ways in which we could remember times in our own past when we thought we were pursuing our self-interest and we were just dead wrong. Uh, I have any number of those occasions in my history. Yeah. You John? Know, uh, uh, Parker at our church, um, uh, he was uh, the head of uh, American West Airlines. He merged with um, American Airlines. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I met had, him. I met him. Talk about that, and years before it happened, and he he did it very carefully in that he approached the unions before he approached the company, which is really rather radical. But it was a success in that situation. Uh, uh -huh. He he had the ability to see those things. Uh, I couldn't begin to. to uh, do what he did. Uh, my mind doesn't work in those circles, you know. Uh -huh. so uh -huh. What is it? What is one of them that failed? You said they n normally fail. What is one of them that failed? Uh, he's talking, and and I don't have he. I don't remember that he detailed them, but he's talking about when a when a corporation will take over a healthy corporation, you know, yeah. and then begin to sell off its assets. They in effect kill the corporation. And uh, and uh, and try to make money with the assets that they then uh, use otherwise. 
and then try if they can to sell the company. I think what he's reporting is that an awful lot of that didn't work. Or you look at the whole derivative scheme that was going on prior to 2008 and nine, you know. Um, I remember an economist at Harvard, I'm not recalling his name right now, but he said he had been uh, advocating derivatives and that form of, he'd been work, uh, been arguing for neoliberalism and taking down the wall between commercial and uh, investment banks and the rest. And uh, someone asked him after the collapse of the economy in 2008, uh, <clears throat> uh, what he thought of about what he'd been advocating. And he said, well, he said, uh, I had no idea they would go on managerial cocaine. <laughs> in other words, he, he wasn't anticipating that some of these uh, the CEOs and the rest would just go nuts the way they did. You know, and as you remember, that that brought this economy down. In fact, the United States government had to had to pull us out of that. If you remember, uh, uh, using your example of uh, wait a minute, I've lost it. Forget about it. Okay. Anybody else? Other comment? Oh, I know. I text what Dallas. Hey, Dallas, is that you on the phone? Yeah, I'm out uh, at the at the uh, Rotary Youth Camp, uh, cutting weeds in the garden. So I'm listening <laughs> while I'm cutting. Oh well, that's that's a, that's good. That's good. Glad you're here. Okay. Did you have a comment? Uh, this is not necessary. This is not necessarily my self-interest. I understand. I understand. Uh, there are there are other motivations besides self-interest. We'll get to some of those. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Dallas, uh, Dallas, is this pure of heart? What's going on here? <laughs> I've never been pure of heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, there that's... is no such thing. <laughs> yeah. But that comment suggests some clarity of a purity of a pure sort. <laughs> Somebody else was trying to get in. Did you have a comment, John, or who was it? Okay. Well, let's take a step. Um, the uh, let's look at interest, story, and tradition. Um, one of the best books written on organizing, I think, is the one by Jeffrey Stout. And uh, he's, uh, he's an ethicist and uh, quite a good one. And uh, he reports that interest is used as a key concept in broad-based organizing, and it is. And I'll talk about that in a minute, or if not today, at least next week. He recognizes that organizers often work with the concept of self-interest in the narrow sense, meaning by that, what have I got to gain or what is my advantage or my, you know, so on. That is, uh, that is, they work in terms of self-interest. But he notes this in his work. He did a study of these folks and so forth. The title of his book is Blessed Are the Organizers. But he says, one of the things that organizing does is to open up people to the common good. And by doing so, this enables them to see how typical notions of self-interest and the way they function provide the kinds of relationships that people actually do need to endorse and enjoy. Uh, let me say that a little different way. In organizing, um, at least in the IF tradition, well, all the organizing that I know of, they don't know much about it. They talk about Hannah Arendt, A-R-E-N-D-T, or Hannah Arendt. Um, very important political philosopher who seems to get more important uh, the, the longer we go after her death. But she says interest comes from the Latin inter esse, meaning between beings. And what she's trying to suggest there is exactly what Jeffrey Stout is pointing uh, to here. That is, if, if suppose an organizer sits down with me and says, uh, uh, Tex, what, what are your interests? Why are you, uh, why are you talking to me? Why, why do you want to, why do you want to be involved in this organizing process? And suppose I say something like, well, I tell you, uh, I'd really like to see my daughter have a better shot at some things. And I, I think there's an awful lot in this society that's keeping it from happening for her. So I've got a real interest 
and my daughter doing better, doing better in her work, um, uh, doing better uh, in the community. You know, I, ju I just like to see that happen. Uh, and he might say, well, uh, that's an important interest. Let's pay attention to that and don't give it up. Don't quit. And then when I start meeting in uh, groups with other people that are organizing, I find out that, well, my, uh, I've still got my daughter in mind, but I'm talking to somebody over here who's actually in a, a fast food job. And his interest is he wants to make $15 in the union. And we begin to talk. And the more we talk, the more I realize, you know, if we increase the minimum wage to $15, that would really help my daughter, <laughs> you know? And uh, I think it would, and, and then you begin to realize, hey, that might help a lot of other people in the room, you know, with that issue. And what I'm trying to suggest by Hannah Arendt's work and by what Jeffrey Stout has said is that as you begin, begin to look at your interests, say in terms of a daughter, and another person in terms of an increase in hourly wage, and say somebody else who wants Medicaid expansion, what you may begin to see is that um, each of those interests have a way of being compounded and working together as we organize to work on a variety of issues. Am I saying that clearly enough? I'm saying that what may seem to be a rather small or narrow self-interest when it's begin when one begins to reflect on it in relationship to the self-interest of others those begin to meld into a conception of the common good for all and uh, i think that's precisely the way that the best organizing i've seen works with self-interest now come back at me have i said that hi janet have i said that uh, carefully enough yeah, I understand what you're saying like there. Oh, yeah. the text is. It's or the word that the, uh, the term that I hear now that mm -hmm. expresses that is intersectionality. Uh huh. Okay. That all of, all of the issues and concerns intersect one another. Uh -huh. So even though my concern, that's really good. My, might be criminal justice uh, but the concern in the community that emerges is homelessness and mental health uh -huh. well if you're working on homelessness and mental health you're working on criminal justice yeah so I think that's a very good insight susan i've not heard anybody quite make that particular connection but i think that's just right yeah i think that's a good a good observation I remember, for example, the millionaire church we started with, uh, they, when we began to talk with them, uh, a lot of these people, you know, were, they had uh, kids and then teenagers, they were very interested in education. And when we began to look at education issues, and some other people were interested in tax issues, and some other people were interested in job training, I was just amazed at the way, at the confluence of those kinds of concerns coming together. And they suggest the kind of intersectionality you're pointing to. I think that's, I think that's a great observation. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> Other comments? Am I clear? That's a big thing. Are we being clear? This is a pretty important move here because I don't know any organizer that doesn't operate initially from trying to find out what people's self-interest are. Okay, Tex, I have a question. Uh, yeah. But what, uh, what? Okay, like uh, trendy. What's our self-interest? Well, uh, in in, uh, in, yeah. in organizing uh, with uh, Stand Up KC or any of those groups. Yeah. Uh, let me let me say just a quick thing before I answer that because I, I don't want you to think I went at that abstractly. If you remember the first year I was at at uh, Trinity, I had one-on-ones uh, -on with people in the congregation and some others every Wednesday afternoon from two to eight. I think uh, Trinity only had about 80 participants when I got there, but um, I, I did 150 one-on-ones the first year I was there. I did more than 150, a little over 150. Now, what I was listening for, quite frankly, was people's 
interests, what they were interested in. Now, as you may, right. as you may know, for a lot of people, there were a lot of people when I got there who were interested in, we want this church to survive. <laughs> we want a vibrant, alive church again. There was a strong LGBTQ component, not only the people who were queer, but also the people who, uh, who by the way, queer is a, a highly acceptable term now if, among the LGBTQ IA community. But uh, so that you had people wanting the church to survive, you had people, and, and I don't mean that just in the sheer survival sense, but the church was important to them. They wanted to be a vital, uh, you know, congregation of the rest, but you also had a strong interest, not only coming from LGBTQ folk, but coming from members of the congregation too. They wanted that. I heard a genuine interest in justice issues and people wanting to be involved in that. I heard people wanting to do study and uh, study and learn and things of that nature. The the importance of the feeding program that was there long before I got there, and you've been a vital part of it. But that that feeding program, how important that was to people. In other words, I was hearing an array of interests. But what was so easy was that there was no contradiction among those interests. I mean, I don't know if you look back at what I've done. I haven't done that much. But what I basically did was simply to uh, find where people's interest was and uh, and uh, and organize around them and delegate stuff to them. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I try not to do the, the work. I try to get people, other people to do it. And and we've got an awful lot of participation now by people in the church and in, in a number of, you know, four, four organizations that I can think of. And every Friday morning when I'm at Urban Summit, uh, Dallas, there's your face. You know, um, and the way you, in which you've taken up some of that. So what I'm trying to suggest is that at what I was hearing at Trinity Church was a, a tremendous confluence of interests that I thought came together inter esse in a beautiful way, address some of the intersectionality that Susan's talking about. And I mean, I think today uh, we've got an awfully vital congregation. What, come, come All right. Back. Disagree with me if you if you if you. No, no, I agree. Uh, I just think this stuff interesting is very very difficult. If you're not asking for, I mean, well, it it's it's very very difficult to determine what your personal self interest is. Yeah, that may be. Um, yeah. That may be. Okay, that's all. And, and well, I would say that I'd say the best way to find it often is in conversation. I find that when people begin to talk about things, very often their, their interests will surface. And that's where, that's where I think the person who's initiated that one-on-one -on -one needs to be very alert. That's one reason why you don't talk much in a one-on-one -on -one if you're in the organizing role, you listen. You try to listen about 60 or 70% of the time. We'll come to this when we talk about the stages of organizing next week, but. Uh, but uh, I, uh, what I learned, and I think it works uh, for discovering self-interest, both in myself and in others, when, mm -hmm. when the conversation allows to mm -hmm. say, what keeps you awake at night? Uh-huh. Oh, what that's good. Night, what gives you a nightmare? Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and and that that uh, really hones in. I think that's good. I, I'd also like to say sometimes it's the stuff that gets you so inspired you can't sleep. <laughs> I think maybe I'll keep you fun. awake at night. Yeah. Yeah, both of them can keep you awake. Yeah. We want to increase the inspiration. <laughs> All right. Can we take a move? <clears throat> uh, Joe Rubio. Um, was the organizer in Phoenix for, I think, eight years while Peggy and I were there 13 years. He was there my last eight years. He has since become one of the two people who's in charge of the IF in the western half of the United States. Uh, he and Paul Turner, uh, who's uh, the son of a very good friend of mine, he and Paul Turner basically run the IF operation in the western United States. And he was an extraordinary organizer. And I remember Joe said to me one time, we don't know what our interests are until we have a story. And that's why when you're doing one-on-ones again, why you want to hear people's story. 
because as you hear people tell their story, you will begin to discern the interests that they have springing up in the context of that story. Joe would argue that there's a direct connection between story and the intensity of an interest and its context so that these provide you can understand why that would provide energy i mean that's where passion is when you got that kind of interest that uh that's really important to you that's where the passion is and that's where the energy is that's necessary to do the organizing uh for the common good Does that make sense yeah uh let me tell you another example um peggy and i lived in uh Goodyear, Arizona, that's where they used to make the tires uh, during World War II. And I don't, I've forgotten now whether, whether they were doing it before then or not. But anyhow, that's Goodyear. And the Royals training camp is six miles north of there. So for those of you who have that kind of interest. Um, and out that way, there was another suburb. It was not my suburb, but uh, another suburban area. And it had a mayor in it who was a free enterprise fundamentalist capitalist of the first order. What I mean, what I mean is he believed Adam Smith to a T. Uh, I tend to be critical of Adam Smith, though there's a lot about Adam Smith I like, but that's another story. Um, the, uh, but we needed his help because of some stuff that was going on out there with respect to housing. So Joe Rubio and I headed out there one day to go talk to him. And on the way out, Joe's telling, them, telling me, now, Tex, don't get into it with him with free enterprise capital. Don't do that. He said, what we're going to do is tell him the story about this Hispanic family we've been working with. So I got you. I got you. Okay, I won't. I'll, 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 I'll watch my mouth. Uh, we got out there and... Uh, he wanted to know what uh, we wanted to talk about. And uh, so we told him the story of a Hispanic family in his neighborhood. This family paid $30,000 down on a house. They didn't handle English real well. They were not, they had come recently from Mexico. They were there legally, but they didn't know English well. I mean, they could manage, I guess, uh, negotiate around a bit with it but they didn't know it well so they were talking with a realtor out there and they managed to uh, get a deal with him and which they paid thirty thousand down dollars down to buy this house and um, uh, and they were they were thrilled to death about it but then after they had been there i've forgotten how long a year maybe two or three the realtor called them and told them they had to move out of the house. And they said, what do you mean we got to move out of the house? We bought the house. He said, no, you didn't buy the house. You rented the house. Wait a minute, we paid you $30,000 down. Yeah, that was to cover the rent in case you couldn't pay it. Well, we told that, that's a true story. I mean, there's some wild stuff that can, I'm not saying that's typical, but that can happen in Phoenix. And when we told that mayor that story, you wouldn't believe how angry he got. He was furious. And he said, all right, what do we need to do to this realtor? <laughs> I mean, he was, he was ready to go at him <laughs> tooth and nail, you know. The thing is, his free enterprise capitalism never came up. And we got him engaged on the issue of the, uh, this violation, really of this Hispanic family. And then he became, interestingly enough, one of the key leaders in our work on housing there on the west side of Memphis. There again, you see, you have that whole issue of interest on the one hand, understood as inter esse. And also you have the notion, uh, oh, I, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't make the point about story. While this guy was a free a fundamentalist, uh, a capitalist fundamentalist, he was nevertheless, a person who believed in fair play. And we, when we put that issue of fair play into the context of that violation by a realtor, this Hispanic, I mean, that's all he wanted to focus on. 
we never got into the question about a rapacious capitalism. We got into the question of what are we going to do about housing out here and people getting treated rightly. And he became a real ally. So that's what I'm trying to suggest in terms of story. You tell the kind of story that somebody relates to. I never understood from him why that took on the kind of meaning it did. I guess we never really pursued it. But somewhere in his past, fair play had become basic to his story. And when you violate fair play, you violated something that runs in him about as deep as anything, okay? So um, story is crucial. Another thing is interest and tradition, and that's very much related to story. Because uh, you were saying something like this a while ago when we first started, when you said something to the effect about uh, how interest occurs in a context. I think it's valuable to think about stories as they occur in various tradition okay now, let me say this too i want to argue that nobody operates apart from a tradition uh, i tell it in this book i think i remember once i was uh in a group with some young adults and one of the people in the room said i don't believe in tradition and uh and uh, kind of took the group aback and said no no indeed i'm a free thinker and I remember one of the young adults said, <laughs> said to him, well, you know, that, that whole free thinker thing is a tradition. It's been around since the uh, 18th century. Maybe you just don't know who you're indebted to. <laughs> you know, it, it just, I never had to say a word. Uh, they did it for me. So we operate out of traditions, even when we think we don't. The question, the important question, which tradition is it? And of course, how do interests factor in the tradition uh, in which you live. Now, uh, the uh, look at this paragraph. Traditions open up spaces of interest variously understood. For example, the positive protocols, in other words, the good stuff that are, that's kind of set in place that enable traditions to pursue goods that are distinctive to them. At the same time, they, when, you, when you've got protocols that are good, that operate to the advantage of, of the group as a whole. All right, on the one hand, you got that. But at the same time, you can exploit that. You can misuse it. You can cheat. Right? That's what I mean by at the same time, these protocols can offer angles of advantage and opportunities to skirt around the prohibitions and the constraints of the rules. Now, I use an illustration, of course, baseball. Let me try that for a moment. Um, the tradition of baseball, uh, I was a sort of a pitcher at one time in my life in college and uh, then later in uh, city leagues and stuff like that. Now, baseball has rules and protocols about pitching. Now, you can, you can throw that ball any way you want to so long as you don't put something on it. In other words, you can't put spit on it. You can't put grease on it or body lotion or slick uh, uh, slick uh, deodorant or anything like that. You can't throw what's called a spitter. So there are really pretty clear protocols that are supposed to guide the conduct of a pitcher when he plays baseball. But of course, there's always that guy who's looking for an angle, <laughs> uh, make the ball slick. Uh, uh, find some way to cheat. Uh, I, I, I remember a ball player I used to love. He, was, he had been a big leaguer. And he told somebody once, did you ever throw a splitter, a spitter? He said, I'm not going to answer that question. I said, well, what do you think about a pitcher throwing a spitter? Well, I think anybody that's a pitcher can't figure out a way to cheat a little it's just not fully aware of the situation now, i disagree with that i'm not supporting it i'm just saying that that's the way self-interest in that negative sense can come into play in a tradition you see the tradition's clear but you still got people that are going to look for an angle i mean that that does happen but still having said that knowing the tradition our traditions out of which various actors, 
institutions, agencies operate. Knowing the compelling stories of the same people and groups, that's essential to grasping the political realities engaged in the work of organizing and in the political efforts for justice. You see, interest occurs in these kinds of contexts and they shape, uh, uh, bungle that, and they shape for use, uh, they, they shape the use of interest is I think of what I'm trying to say there. Um, let me put it another way. When you're working for justice and you are working with people in a given tradition, what you want to do is keep that the best of that tradition before people in such a way that you don't get into the kind of violations, kind of uh, the kind of bad moves that take away from the common good. Uh, let me say it another way. Suppose you're working with cultural traditionalists. That's one of the largest lifestyle uh, enclaves in this society. They typically believe in family. They believe in faith. They believe in patriotism. And they believe in land or territory or the place where they live. All right. Now, <clears throat> you can get in a group of those folks. And let's say they, they hear dog whistle politics or something else. And they begin to act on something. Not only is it contrary to their interests, but it violates the interests of other people who are working for the common good. Um, I'm going to be political for a minute. Uh, well, I'm political all the time. <laughs> uh, when you have somebody talking about tax reform and they tell cultural traditionalists they're going to, they're going to cut their taxes, very often what that means is their taxes are cut about the amount of a price of shoes while those politicians are guaranteeing wealth, price uh, tax cuts of a huge order. Let me just give you an example. In, in, in the 1950s, corporate America paid 32% of the tax revenue in the country. I'm talking about federal taxes. They now pay 7%. That has happened through a host of tax breaks that are typically promoted by telling cultural traditionalists they're going to get a tax break, and they do. And they get nickel and dimed in terms of tax breaks, while the rich have become richer and richer and richer. Now, I can do chapter and verse on that with you. I might have to go to my notes to do it, but I can show you that uh, in, uh, in multiple ways. Uh, we have 55 major corporations in the United States who pay no taxes whatsoever. You probably know that, but uh, you understand what I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> When we talk with people who are, when I say cultural traditions, these people are typically red. They vote red. Arizona, for example, has got thousands of them. Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, thousands of them. And uh, and I, I can uh, there I can get so angry at politicians who won't pay these people any attention, and uh, while other politicians are using them like crazy. I'm just trying to suggest that that a, a sharper aware of their awareness of their interests needs to be developed by paying attention to what their culture is. They are cultural traditionalists. Family means everything. Good Lord, there are all kinds of things you can do when you start talking truly about somebody's family and about where their family's getting screwed over. You, know, you understand what I'm trying to suggest? So there is tradition uh, at, at work there. Pay attention to the tradition. We got so many progressives, quite frankly, who always want to tell those folks they need to get over their uh, more traditional commitments. Uh, that drives me crazy. Uh, just drives me crazy. Uh, I've, I've spent a good deal of my life working with white working class folks, and they get used by people who talk racist crap with them and then get them doing stuff that's really, really contrary to their self-interest. Am I communicating? So being in touch with somebody's tradition, respecting that tradition, and yeah, working with them and looking for the essay that we've been talking about, 
and, 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 and respect the tradition. I know there are things in any tradition. I don't respect the racist the history of my tradition in Mississippi, but there's good stuff in Mississippi that, that I think you could work with, you know. So how do you respect that tradition and work there and, and again, therefore to, to, to move in the direction of common good? Uh, am I am I talking? Do you understand? <laughs> I mean, am I communicating? That's any comment. We um, don't hear enough of that. I I I know that. I know that. I I I was on the phone with uh, Congressman Cleaver yesterday for an hour, and uh, and he's one of the really good Congress people, I think. And uh, uh, he and I were talking about that very thing. And he says, it's just dead right. He said, I don't know what we're going to have to do to get the Democratic Party leadership to pay attention to it. Uh, that he well, is a, we got to talk. We got to talk about it as much as we talk about the injustices of blacks. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. In fact, I said that in my and life. Liber and, and, and good liberals don't like to do that. I know good liberals don't like working people. They wouldn't like black right. working people if they were hanging out with them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, let's take a move. Is that clear? If that's clear, we can move on to interests as loves. Um, there's a piece of me that will always be Augustine, Augustinian. Uh, he's uh, there are a lot of things he, he bothers me about. But, uh, you know, when he does the city of God, he talks about there are two kinds of love. He says the earthly city is created by self-love, reaching to the point of contempt for God. We could also talk about contempt for the, the common good of the people. And he says, but there's also um, the, uh, the heavenly city. Um, oh, let me say one other quick thing. He sees the earthly city as run by the lust for domination, okay? I love that phrase because I think it, it just really names some big stuff going on. The heavenly city, on the other hand, is characterized by the love of God. And it's carried out so far that it can be sometimes contempt for self, that it finds its highest glory in God, and it is, it's expressed in obedience uh, to God. So it's, it's that kind of Augustinian notion that got me thinking about self-interest or interest as love. You know, maybe what interests really tell us is what we love. So uh, I tried to pull some of that together to examine interest in terms of what people love. And organizing, when you get at the heart of somebody's energy and commitments, when you get at the deepest level of interest, meaning by that, where is their commitment? Where's their passion? Uh, how is that embodied in them? What performative uh, consequences does it have? But it, when that resides in the loves of a person or a group, uh, this doesn't mean you leave story and tradition, but it helps you to understand that love is operating in those. And so even when you look at tradition, what is the love? that's powerfully moving in the midst of that, you understand? So I'm trying to suggest that uh, our key stories and traditions, and I'm using Alice Dare McIntyre here, whom I really like, uh, they are socially embodied. That is key stories and traditions are socially embodied. They take up residence in our bodies, folk. They're in our guts, they're in our hearts. Huh? Um, and they're, and they are historically extended. I mean, you know, when we discover what you really love, that tends to hang on, tends to hang on with you. Now, these stories and traditions can be profoundly conflicted. They can be contradictory, you know. And that's the reason why interest can often fly in the face of other commitments. The ball player who throws the spitter, you know. But it's also a major resource to know somebody's story, to know their tradition, to know their loves and the way in which those three things operate and move together. I mean, that's really to be privileged, to be privy uh, to the very heart of who people are, where they're moving. And I think opens the door for the kind of uh, organizing 
around the common good and working through interest and to, and to, and to make justice a very real possibility and not, not, a, not a perfect justice. We'll, we'll always struggle as far as I can tell. But nevertheless, those relative justices that we're always fighting for. Uh, a quick story. Uh, back in 1960, no, it was 1970, <clears throat> um, a group of Black Panthers went to a United Methodist Church in Kansas City um, and sat down on the front. No, they, they went up and sat on the platform. A couple of them did. They told them that they regarded the seats up there as a sinner's bench and they wanted to join the church. Now, I'm not, I don't know what their motivation was. I'm just telling you, they went, this was a, an all white church and had a kind of a negative, rep, you know, it had a negative reputation in the black community. They go in there and sit up there and one thing leads to another. And these black Panthers and members of that church get into a fist fight i promise you it's a, a fist fight in the sanctuary somebody broke the pole of the american flag over the back of somebody else of course the panthers were arrested and jailed and i'd been working as a kind of a chairperson of a group that was trying to get the uh trying to reconcile the Methodist Center City Parish, which was in the Black community, and some of the church leaders in Kansas City, white church leaders. So I remember we, <laughs> we were working on seeing if we could get that conflict worked out. I won't go into all that. It's too long a story. So I got called in, and... Uh, <laughs> They wanted me to do two things, uh, not the church at this point, but the, the denomination wanted me to do two things. One, they wanted me to see if we could get the Panthers out of jail and let the, let the church as a whole work with the issue and, and, uh, and, and, and get it out of the state government. Okay. You know, in other words, we didn't want this going through the courts. We wanted the church to handle this conflict. The second thing they wanted me to do was to preach the following Sunday at that church, <laughs> which scared the living with Jesus out of me. Um, so two or three of us went to see the attorney general in the city about dropping the charges and letting the church handle it, since this was a church issue and so on and so forth. I never will forget what he told us. He listened to us for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And he said, he said this to us, look, if you think that I'm going to throw away, I may not be quoting exactly, it's exactly in the book, I think. If you think I'm going to throw away a political opportunity like this, you just don't understand politics. In other words, he wanted to use his arrest of the, the arrest of the Panthers, his prosecution of them as a way to uh, ensure his election as governor, which he would later run for and win. <laughs> I'm trying to say, uh, when you get in a situation like that, you know, uh, how do you talk about self-interest? How do you talk about tradition? How do you talk about, you know, love? Well, it, it took a while. In fact, it may have taken a couple of meetings. I don't remember. But we finally somehow were able to talk him out of prosecuting the Panthers and got that back so that the Panthers and the church could work together and work it out. I don't to this day know how it happened. I don't know what went on with the attorney general exactly, but somewhere in all of that, he began to leave that notion of his political self-interest and the way he was going to use it, I think in racist ways, uh, but we got out of it. I don't think we could have gotten out of it if we hadn't been dealing with all those story and tradition and, you know, yeah, and... And 
you know, loves. So Ernesto Cortez, he's, he's the charismatic leader of the Industrial Areas Foundation, the old Alinsky Enterprise, and ran it for years after Alinsky died. Alinsky died in 1970, 71, 72, right along in there. Uh, Cortez says this, and hear this, because I think this is the point of what we said so far. The potential of ordinary people fully emerges only when they are able to translate their self-interest in issues such as family, property, and education into the common good through an intermediary organization. Okay. I think that's the basic point about self-interest we've been arguing so far. And we've got to do power. I'm sorry this is taking so long. I knew this was going to be a long chapter, but what kind of comments you have so far? Any, any comment about that? Let, yeah, me, let me understand. <clears throat> uh, you're talking about uh, in baseball throwing uh, a splitter. It, yeah. are, are those rules written down? Or are they just... I, I believe that the spitter is written in there. I haven't read the rules lately, so I don't remember, but it I can tell you it is strictly outlawed. Yeah, no question about it. That's what, so because I know that during the Civil War there were certain rules that of things never got written down, but they were followed very strictly by both uh sides, both armies. You know, they were yeah. you you never shot a soldier while he was doing his business. Uh uh -huh. Never did that, and that was a yeah. um, some books here that make that point. <clears throat> you, you could shoot him any other way, but when he was doing his business, you didn't shoot him, whether he was uh, from the south or the north, both ways. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you just didn't do it. But so you're saying there are certain ways you can learn how to get around the rules and and. And some oh. pitchers might use it, like some congressmen, there are rules, but they learn ways to get around okay. those things as part of who they are. Oh, yeah. There are pitchers who violate the rules anytime they can. Wow. Oh, yeah. I sure. Never knew that. See, if, you get to, if you get that ball completely, now I, I never tried to throw a splitter because I had enough trouble trying to throw a fastball in a curve, but if, but if you get one side of that ball wet with a honky, you know, just, you just find a way to, you got something in your hair, you rub your hand through your hair and then slick that ball. There, there, are, there are people who can really make that thing move. And when you've got that kind of advantage on a hitter, yeah. And, and it's forbidden. It's outlawed in the game. So a uh, congressman learns those rules too. You, well, and, sure. Uh, yeah. uh, that's sad. Well, people, yeah. Well, people violate rules in all kinds of ways. So who was the uh, uh, state attorney that became mayor that? Uh, smoking, okay. what was his name? Smoking Joe? Uh, Teasdale? Teasdale. I think, I think that's right. Teasdale, yeah, Joe Teasdale. Joe Teasdale. Could have been. All right. I think that's right. I remember he changed his mind. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna tell you <laughs> just quickly that next Sunday I'm about five minutes into the sermon and this black guy walks down the aisle on the pulpit side. He's about six three or four and he weighs about two sixty two seventy, and sits down about seven. Uh, rose back from the front and I, I simply don't know <laughs> what he's going to do. <laughs> the amazing thing was he just sat there. He listened. He even told me he liked the sermon <laughs> later, <laughs> but, uh, it scared me to death. I, I re it made me remember a professor I had at Boston university who said, just remember one thing when you're preaching, preaching and something happens, just keep the blessed sound of going. <laughs> <laughs> That's about all I think I was able to do. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Let's move to power. I'll try to be quicker. Okay. 
Uh, Bernard Loomer wrote one of the best articles on power I've ever read. I still reread it every few years just to make sure, well, to try to remember what, I, try to find what I've forgotten. He says there are two conceptions of power, basically. One is the ability to produce an effect, to make something happen. The other one is the capacity to level a shaping and determining influence on the other. I'm sorry. That's a part of number one. What did I do? The other form of power is the ability to take an effect. In other words, to endure something that happens to you. I screwed that up. I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, make, make, make a note there to change that. One is the capacity to you know, act on the other to produce an effect. I mean, the first is, and the second is the capacity to endure an effect. I've known boxers who know who really knew how to hurt people with their hands, huh? but they could not take a punch. You know, or think about it another way. What about the kind of person who uh, knows not only how to make things happen, but also knows how to behave and what to do when something happens to them and the kind of capacity, the kind of power that's required to be able to endure some kind of an impact on you. Um, I think Martin King had a tremendous capacity to endure an effect. You remember when the woman stabbed him? That was fairly early on in his, in his uh, civil rights activity. As he was awakening, the first thing he asked about was how she was doing. Was she okay? Not only that, he refused. He refused to press charges. You know, now Martin King was not a perfect person, as you know, but there were some things about that man that were really uh, quite extraordinary. Um, so, Bo Bloomer also talks about unilateral versus relational power. Unilateral power, that's when I've got power and you're relatively powerless and I can act on you and you have very little you can do in return, at least unless something changes like organizing. <laughs> Unilateral power is a zero sum game. That is, if one group gets power, the other experiences loss of power. And the, the resulting inequalities of power Extend and deepen the estrangements of the losers in this power game. In other words, if you're constantly dominated, if you're constantly uh, feeling the impact of inequality, of oppression, of domination, of uh, you know, struggling with income, struggling with housing, struggling with education, yeah, 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 um, then uh, those kinds of inequalities extend and deepen the kind of estrangements that losers experience. But the winners also lose. Here's one of the most important things I think in, uh, in Loomer. The winners also lose because of the constrictive, don't ever forget this, the constrictive character of, of life lived in behalf of linear power. In other words, if your life becomes focused on dominating people, on having power over, on running people, on controlling things, you are going to experience a very real kind of alienation. Look at, look at what Loomer, Loomer claims that the life lived in pursuit of linear power enacts revenge on its actors. It narrows life. It represses other vital energies. Hmm. I'm talking about those beyond power. It denies communal life. How can you be constantly thinking about how I can run stuff and then have communal life with other people? And then it loses, Loomer says, the deeper mystery of existence. And then you lose the lack of sensibility for the other. What he's suggesting here, and you hear that, is that when you are trying to do power over, it screws you over. <laughs> All right. 
it constricts life. Uh, it makes you less. Uh, it damages stature. That's his claim. Um, he says the constriction of life, the captivity to power. You know, I often talk about, and Dallas and others at Trinity can verify this. I often talk about Paul and how the captivities uh, have us trapped and so forth. What I need to talk more about is the way there can be a captivity to power and it's too exclusive usage and purpose and the way that deadens our human sensibilities and blocks the full flow of energy. See, Loomer is a process thinker. He has this notion of God's energy is flowing through us and it, it makes for a greater range of capacities and human completion. So relational power understood as the ability to produce and to undergo an effect, uh, thus receiving of influence and impact. It's not just some passive receptivity. It's an active openness. And were we absolutely, uh, absolutely unable to receive, receive any kind of influence, we would not be a self at all because each of us is constituted of our relationships. We are our relationships experiences, and these constitute the relationships of the self and makes freedom possible. Um, I love the story of Helen Keller and Anne Hathaway. The, uh, most of this group, I think, would be old enough to remember that. You remember Helen Keller could not see or hear, born without either of those capacities. And they did a movie of her, uh, uh, what is it, 30 years ago, maybe more. And uh, the family brought in- For Helen like 50. 50, oh my goodness. Well, they brought in a teacher named Anne Hathaway to teach her because the schools couldn't work with her. Nobody else could work with her. It was just endless frustration. I don't know, but you think about it, if you can't see and you can't hear, how do you learn? And she was bratty. You know, she was kind of wild and uh, kind of crazy. I'm talking about Keller, all that stuff. And Anne Hathaway is trying to break through that wall. She's trying to have an, an impact that Helen Keller can receive. And she is having one hell of a time with Helen. She's trying to show her that the marks that she's making in her hand actually name experiences she's having in the world. If she can ever, ever get her to recognize that what she's doing on the palm of her hand reflects a world out there, she's got a doorway through which she can go. If Helen Keller can ever receive an effect, she then will have the power to make an effect on the world besides just the craziness she's into as a result of all that deprivation. They're out there by a well, you know, one of these old pump wells and, and, and Helen is playing in the water and, and her teacher, Anne Hathaway keeps splashing her with the water a bit and doing a W A T E R in her hand. She keeps W A T E R. W-A-T-E-R. She keeps doing that over and over again. And initially, uh, Helen Keller wants nothing to do. I'm sick of this game. I'm sick of this. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't have language to say that. But there comes that moment when she realizes that that splashing, that splashing cool, whatever way she had to talk, talk about that or think about that is what, this, what these marks are in her hand. And when it hits her, she grabs uh, Hathaway's hand and she starts to draw in her hand, W-A-T-E-R. I mean, it is just an, ex an explosive moment uh, in that movie, if you remember. And folks, there is power. When you can receive an effect, yeah. But when you can also have an effect.
uh, in the world, with the world, with people. I mean, it's, uh, I need to get that. Uh, Tim, let's get that movie sometime and let's clip, cut that clip and get permission to use it somehow because it is just a magnificent moment. But anyhow, in working for the common good, relational power is that expression of give and take that grows from practices of life together and mutual conversation and mutual conversation can be drawing water in the hand of somebody okay so loomer speaks expressly to the importance of being present to one another and what you get in that movie is how well Anne hathaway is so present learning constantly from Helen Keller. This is not only to re reveal oneself to the other, but also to assist the other in doing the same. So this kind of meeting each other recognizes the inequalities. It characterizes everyone. The challenge on Loomer's view is to open up the opportunities and to enrich the relationships huh, so that members of a group are transformed into individuals and groups, hear this language, of greater stature greater stature you're the difference between somebody who's so narrowly interested in i want to control and i want power by god how constricted that is and here the difference between somebody who says yes i've got power i want power but i want mutual power i want power that we exchange i want that interactive flow i want that relational character of power and then watch the kind of stature that can occur in those kinds of relationships and those kinds of action. Certainly at its best, that's what I think organizing for the common good really is. Quick story about Jessica Johnson. Jessica Johnson, did you know her, John? Uh, young attorney in Phoenix, member of Asbury United Methodist Church, uh, about five feet two, uh, just a lovely person. No, I, and, and I did not know her, no. Yeah. I was, I was teaching a Sunday school class at Asbury. That's where we went. 40% LGBTQ folks, uh, kind of a left-wing congregation, had a great pastor, Jeff Proctor Murphy and so forth. And uh, uh, so I was teaching a Sunday school class there for a while, year two or three. And Jessica was in this group. Now, Jessica is very smart. She's a lawyer, okay, in this group. And she never opens her mouth. She is so shy, she won't say anything. I see her between classes, you know, I say, hey, Jessica, when are you going to start talking? Well, sometime, sometime. You could not get her to say a word. We got her involved in community organizing in Phoenix. And after she had been working with us about a year doing one-on-ones and all that kind of stuff, uh, <laughs> We were calling together the two mayoral candidates of Phoenix. They were going to come to a group. We were going to have 150, 200 people there. We invited them to come, and each of them, to talk about their program. Now, we told them, you can't stump speech. We want to hear. No, I'm sorry. We had questions for them. We said, we want you to answer our questions, not make your stump speech. So that was the instruction to the candidates. And we asked Jessica to chair it, <laughs> you know, to be the MC, et cetera. The, I think the Democrat got up first, might have been the Republican, and he goes about five minutes answering our questions and then starts his stump speech. Jessica stopped him. She stopped him and said, sir, you remember you're to answer our questions and you are not to make a stump speech. Will you please go to the next question? He did. Later, the next candidate, Republican or Democrat, stands up. He does about five minutes answering our question, and then he moves into his stump speech. She stops him again. <laughs> Second candidate, she stopped that night and says, go back to our questions. And he does. What is interesting is <laughs> the event was so... <laughs> it was so newsworthy that they ran it in the Phoenix paper the next day. Now, what happened there is you're seeing the kind of stature that can come to be with a person like Jessica because she was involved in that kind of organizing work and because she was experiencing, I would want to say, relational power. 
I mean, it was, it was, it was damn near miraculous. That's how, uh, that's how powerful it was. Ah, Foucault. What can I say? Let me see if I can summarize this. We got Foucault and truth and power. Okay. Let me tell you three things that are important about Foucault and you can read the rest of it, I think. Sorry, this got to you late, uh, but anyhow. First thing is, um, Foucault would argue that nobody possesses power. Power is a medium that flows through relationships. It is power is a strategic relationship of force, he says. Now, he means by force something more like energy than coercion, though it can take coercive forms, of course. Um, but uh, so that one of the implications of that is nobody possesses power. And nobody is ever utterly powerless. I think that's an important notion. In fact, if you want to build relation, relational power on a Foucaultian uh, model, what you do is you enter into an organizing mode in such a way that you change the relationships and therefore you change the medium of power as it's circulating through those relationships. You understand what he's saying? Another important thing about Foucault is that um, is the relationship of truth and power. He would argue that anytime somebody has power, they have to have a discourse that's adequate to sustain and enhance the power. So that discourse and power work together all right um uh, he works with an ascending analysis of power that power comes from the bottom of the society up and that means that when you change the relationships at the bottom you change the distribution of power hear, hear, hear what he's arguing there um quickly um yeah better two stories one is Phoenix. We were talking to the chief of police in Phoenix. Uh, you know, you got a lot of Hispanic folks, Latinx folks in Phoenix. Um, most of those folks, great people. I had not spent a lot of time around a massive number of brown folk till I got to Phoenix. I really enjoyed it. Developed friendships. Da, da, da. Um, but you've always got some people who aren't good folks. So they had a criminal element in there. And, uh, and the people who had criminals living in the same neighborhood they did would not call the police because they also had some other illegal people who were there, say out of Mexico. And if they called the police, they were afraid to call the police on the criminal element. They'd also arrest some of their neighbors who were good people just trying to make it. So they wouldn't call them. So we worked out an arrangement with the chief of police that we were gonna do a walk in the neighborhood. And he does. He just goes into the neighborhood and starts talking to Hispanic folks there. And one of the things he tells those people is, I am not going to be an official of the United States Immigration Department. You can call me when you have trouble and I will send police and we're not going to arrest people here who are here without papers. He made them that promise. Well, it wasn't, it was, I don't know, there was a week or two before that, there was a man beating his wife in a house next to one of the people that the, that the chief of police had met with. And uh, they, she called the police. She trusted what the chief had said. She called the police and they came out, but she didn't handle English well. And they thought she was saying that her husband was beating her. So they started arresting her husband, handcuffed him, were taking him to the police car. She's trying to explain, but not having any luck. She runs back in the house and gets the business card that the chief of police had given her, runs back out to the police at the patrol car, starts pointing at the card and saying, call, call, call. The police <laughs> called the chief. And the chief said, hey, he's one of ours. 
don't arrest them, get somebody out there that can speak Spanish. So they spent, sent a patrolman out that could speak Spanish. They got the right guy arrested and they started working with that family in terms of what they do with that. But see what I'm trying to say is when you begin to build those connections and you change the relationships, you change the distribution of power and you make you know a, a common good possible. Now, truth and power, I was beginning to get into that. <clears throat> um, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here about um, the relationship of discourse and a form of life. See, uh, Foucault does not believe that we know truth in any ultimate sense. We always do interpretations, but he's really talking about we have a discourse that has a certain intelligibility in terms of the form of life that we live in. So those things cohere. So truth changes. Truth is historically conditioned, if you will. It changes over time. But nevertheless, the relationship of discourse to uh, power, very, very important. And so that if you want to get good <laughs> at, at mutual power, then by golly, you better have a discourse adequate to it. This is why all the talking we've done about, you know, talkability and walkability and all those things, those things are so important. So here's the point. Power means not only organizing, it also means having the kind of discourse. Let me say it another way. Having to, being able to talk, knowing the right words, being able to say the right things, the relationship those have to organize and the relationships those have to justice, the relationships those have to the common good are really important. So story. Uh, I was with a group uh, at State House in Arizona. We were... Uh, we were there lobbying for uh, a piece of legislation having to do with poor folks. Um, we were talking with one of the most uh, conservative legislators in the uh, in the in the House of Representatives there, and we've been talking to him about ten minutes about this piece of legislation. We knew we were getting nowhere, so the legislator said this: oh, "Look." I've got to go, but I want to remind you that this issue of the poor, that's not a legislative, that's not our issue. That's the church's issue. You remember what Jesus said about, you know, caring for the folks who are hungry and in jail and everything else. And uh, he smiled at us. Oh God, I hate those kind of smiles smile like you know I've, I've put you church folks in your place you know we had a wonderful young woman in the group who said uh mr representative i think maybe you've not had opportunity to read matthew 25 lately what that text is addressed to is not the church if you'll read it carefully it's addressed directly to the nations we'll read it I mean, he choked. <laughs> he choked on it. He could not say a word. He coughed a couple of times, said, well, I've got to get to a meeting, excuse me, and left. Discourse, talk, it's relationship to a form of life, it's connection to power, it's capacity to, to, to speak to the common good, to raise the common good. Uh, those things are profoundly interrelated i'm sorry i just couldn't get through this tonight comments or questions i think we've got three minutes having just uh lived through the state of kansas supreme court uh, uh, deciding that the redistricting is just fine yeah. uh, makes me wonder about discourse and truth and uh justice and and i would say perhaps the lack of courage of people who have the power to override and mm -hmm. do something new mm -hmm. walking away from that yeah. i i don't know Susan, I share your frustration. Let me say one thing, though, in defense of discourse and the rest. Let's go back for a minute to cultural traditionalists. One of the things we have not had 
that I'm aware of in Kansas and Nebraska and Missouri and, uh, and Iowa. We've not had people who I, I want to say care about the common good, who know how to talk the discourse of, tra of cultural traditionalists. Uh, I can, I can uh, send you to things, and I'm talking Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the Democrats drive me crazy. Um, you know, and uh, Congressman Cleaver yesterday just talking about, I don't know what it's going to take to get the Democratic Party leadership to realize we got to start talking the language of cultural, traditional people. So what I would say there is where we've got to do in this part of the world, well, in a whole bunch of places in the United States now, because the Democrats abandoned those folks. I don't think there's much question about it. Now, the Republicans took advantage of it. And what initiated this was when the Democratic Party went with civil rights in the 60s, Southern states moved from the Democratic realm right into the Republican realm. Racism plays a basic factor in that shift. Uh, and I remember the 90s when I was here, the Democratic Party ran Missouri. But I think the National Democratic Party, and I don't mean to sound like a Democrat, I'm an independent Christian. But I'm just saying that people who used to pay attention to rural Missouri, Harry Truman could talk to the people of Missouri. You know, maybe he wasn't as successful in Kansas, but he could talk to people in Missouri, you know, and, uh, and the Democratic Party used to do it. I'm just trying to make the case that I think there is a discourse and a relationship to power and the form of life of those folks. I saw a statistic just quickly. Um, the... Uh, the average farmer in the United States has a $1,500 deficit from farming, from farming. And they have to work outside off the farm in order to be able to farm. I can send you those data if you want them. The, 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 the hollowing out of rural America that's going on in this society is obscene. It's just obscene. And the need for a discourse that can speak to that, the organizing of farmers and small business, small business people are getting their lunches eaten in this in, in, in small town rural America. Banks, are you aware that small banks give better deals to, to real people than do the big mega banks? I don't think people know that. We've got those data. Those data exist. We need somebody who knows how to talk to these cultural traditionalists. I'm trying to say discourse and power still relate. We just got to be committed to doing it for the common good. The sad part about the Kansas Supreme Court, it has more of the justice reported uh, uh, have been appointed by Democrat governors. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, I, I'll Obama, <laughs> I voted for him twice. Okay, but do you know that Obama called the corporate America into his office? Uh, after the collapse of the economy, 2008, nine, and he told them, don't worry, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Oh. These, some of these people had violated the law. They had engaged in criminal activity and Obama let them off the hook. Yep. Um, Locked on all their houses. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, on all their houses. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, the, the best person I know is, uh, uh, to, in terms of criticism there, uh, um, black guy, Harvard, Princeton, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, Cornell was? Yeah, Cornell. Cornell. Yeah. Uh, take a look at Cornell West. He, he yeah. does yeah. Less speak around. He's awesome. He's, 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 he's awesome. awesome. Yeah, and uh, he's, he's a source of a lot of my work, but there are things. Folks, you've been very generous with your time. I'm sorry. I, we'll try to find more time for you to talk next time, okay? Josh, before you leave, you you said up front this was a heavy duty chapter. Yeah. My particular view is break it in half, run an extra week well, so that it gets fair shake. I don't know every uh, everybody else's schedule, but I would love that. Well, y'all think about it. I'm will, I'm certainly willing to do it. I don't have any problem with that. And uh, we could take an extra week if you'd like, uh, so you can be thinking about it. But I'm. You can see that it's just a lot to get. Uh, it's a lot to get through. Probably that should be two chapters in the book, not just one. You know. But, and you you notice that I don't have any hesitancy about loading your wagon. Oh, I'm. I, hey, 
you you would be hard pressed to like this more than I do. <laughs> uh, I love this stuff, you know. So, well, think about it, and we'll look at it next week, and we'll try to try to. Uh, but you know, I find that letting you talk and get into the thing as we work along is better than me going through the whole chapter and then throwing it open. Do you experience it that way? Yeah, incremental is better. Incremental, okay. Oh, well, you think about it. And again, you're not going to hurt my feelings to say sample. The sooner we get through this, the better. I'll, I'll, I'll get that. But we'll we'll look at that next week. OK. All right. Hey, folks, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Go in peace. May the God of peace go with you.